On top of old Smoky, all covered with snow, a wind is a blowing to the valleys below. <laughs> pa, Pa, letter for you, Pa. All the way from Ohio, the postmark shows. Ohio? What would an Ohio Yankee be writing me for? I don't know, sir. But there it is, the address. Burley Ronfield Esk. Esk? What does that mean, Pa? E-S-Q. Esquire, son. It don't mean a thing, except that somebody's trying to butter me up. Burley Ronfield, Stones River near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It's been a time getting here, too. The postmark says April 14th, 1870. Well, this here's the last of May. Open it, why don't you, Pa? Maybe it's something pretty special. Even if it did come from a Yankee in Ohio. Tall tales I can tell you, so listen and learn. There are ghosts in the valley. Belong. A Tennessee farmer and his son, and a letter postmarked from Ohio in the year of 1870. That's how our story starts. Before it is over... We'll step still farther back in time to the winter of 1863, January, in the Battle of Stones River. So settle back and listen to another of Tennessee's tall tales. Some kind of mistake here, son. This, this letter isn't for me. But it's addressed to you, Pa. Why is it a mistake? Because I never captured a Yankee in my life. This man says I took him prisoner back in 63. Now he wants a certificate of parole. <laughs> well, I guess it's too bad about him. He'll have to apply to another man. Ain't but one burly Ronfield I know of, and that's me. <laughs> Except you, son. You're burly Ronfield, too. Yes, sir. And I guess you must have been all of 12 years old when General Bragg was chasing Rosencrantz Yankees all over Rutherford County in that winter of 62 and 63. Yes, sir. And I don't reckon you was rounding up any of those Yankees and holding them prisoner, was you? Yes, sir. Uh, you mean, no, sir, don't you? No, sir. I mean, yes, sir. I mean, I... Well, we... Some others and me, we did take some prisoners. I don't think I quite get you, Burley. You're telling me that you and some other boys took federal troops prisoner while the fight was going on? You... Took prisoners and held them? For a while we did. Fed and Benny Meadows and some others and me. We got over 200 Yankees and marched them to the Confederate picket lines. Burley, come over to this beech tree and let's sit down and you tell me about this. I don't aim to call my own son a liar. No, sir. But dogged if I don't think you're stretching the truth to the breaking point. Dogged if I don't think so. Sitting by the roadside on a summer day, chatting with my messmates, passing time away, lying in the shadow underneath the trees. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. When a horseman passes, the soldiers have a rule to cry out at their loudest, Mister, there's your mule. But on another pleasure, enchanting -er than these, is wiring out your grinders, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. On December 26, 1862, an estimated 42,000 federal troops under General William Rosencrans advanced on Murfreesboro and the Confederate earthworks on Stones River. Opposing them were 37,800 southern troops commanded by General Braxton Bragg. The battle lasted from December 31st through January 2nd. When it ended, the federal troops were in Murfreesboro. On New Year's Eve, however, those same soldiers fled in disorder as the Confederates' onslaught crumple, crumpled the Union right wing. Confused and despairing Yankees stumbled through cedar thickets by the thousands. 
Hundreds of them fell into Confederate hands. Burley Ronfield and his son remember the scene because they lived on the edge of the bloody battlefield and saw the seesaw engagement played out to its conclusion. The Federals' whole right wing caved in, Pa. You remember how it was. <laughs> Those Yankees were spilling off the battlefield like rabbits from a brush fire. Thad and Benny must have been 17 then, but they let me come with them down to the river to watch. How close up you going? Hey, you aren't going any nearer, are you? Fed, we'll likely get killed, won't we, if we push on? We aren't gonna get killed, not if we keep our eyes peeled. Say, look at him run. Let's go back, fellas. Fed, let's go back. Cry, baby. Go on, go on back if you're gonna blubber. I'm not blubbering. Everybody duck down. I'm gonna yell halt. And we're gonna take us some Yankees. You call them crazy, Fed Bellas? Take prisoners? Sure. They're scampering right into our arms. They're asking for it. Fed motioned us to stay hidden in the weeds and bushes on the riverbank. All of a sudden, he jumped up and boomed out, Halt! He looked at least six feet high. You sure took an awful chance. We didn't know it. Why, Pa, we must have got 200 before nightfall on Wednesday. That was the first day of the battle, before the tide turned against the Confederates. What did you do with the Federals? Like I said, Pa, we marched them up to our pickets and turned them over. If I'd known what you boys were up to, I'd have tanned your hide. But, Pa, you were hiding out soldiers in our house. That was dangerous. Well, it was my duty to help the cause where I could. And Eddie was riding with Morgan's men... And Philip was in General Bragg's army. They were a proper age to shoulder the responsibility. I was big for my age. <laughs> well, you you sure thought you were anyway. You wouldn't have whipped us, would you, Pa? No, son, I wouldn't have laid a hand on you. We needed every brave man who'd help us. Even a brave man of twelve. We bagged us a colonel, too, Pa. A colonel? Well, mighty big game, Burley. He made Thad mad. Wouldn't give himself up at first. I'll show him blast his eyes in his shiny boots. Let's go get more, fellas. Fed, he's not going anywhere. He don't know where he left his troops, and he don't want to find them or I miss my guess. Come on, you've got the idea. We'll surround that Yankee colonel and turn him over to our pickets before nightfall. Lucky, weren't you? But I still say you might have gotten your brains blown out. That was Wednesday. Remember, Pa, when you came back to the house Friday night and said it was over? That General Bragg was going to withdraw? Yes, I remember. Took ten tons of ammunition to fight the Battle of Stones River. The trunks of living trees was honeycombed with bullets. The dead men in gray put up a gallant fight. They made the victory a costly one for the North. We paroled our prisoners... Just as if we'd really been part of the Confederate Army. You didn't have the right, you know. Well, none of the Yankees argued. They took the parole papers and no questions asked. <laughs> yes, until now. What do you mean, until now, Pa? <laughs> well, listen what you've done to the political fortunes of, of this fellow, uh, Immelmeyer. Horatio Immelmeyer. I, I'll read you from his letter. Sir, I would have appreciate it if you would send me a certificate of parole. I received the original paper from you on December 31st, 1862, uh, during the Battle of Stones. I wonder how many of them you signed, buddy. Any recollection? Thad and Benny and me and others, we took turns. Nobody argued with us over it, like I said. We were just trying to help out, Pa. I signed my name big and bold <laughs> like we learned to in school. <laughs> well, you must have. This this fellow Immelmeyer remembered it all right. What does he want with a new parole paper, Pa? Well, he's running for the state legislature up there, and his opponent is accusing him of deserting the colors in war. He says he lost the original. A uh, political opposition has attempted to turn my war record against me, and accusations have been made that I deserted my company under fire. Sir, if you could see your way clear to issue a copy or a notarized testament to the effect that I was taken prisoner and later paroled back to the Union forces, I would be your most obliged countryman, Horatio Emelmeyer. Well, 
I'd sure like to help him out. Well, you can't. It wouldn't be legal, you know. You and the rest of those scamps never had the right to parole a man in the first place. Yes, sir. So, Mr. Emmelmeyer have to fight his political battles without your help. I guess you're right, Pa. Except, who'd ever know? Well, uh, you, uh... That isn't the point. The point is you didn't have the authority. In fact, you never did. But you could write him a letter and sign your name to it. <laughs> that would be all right, I guess. And say I know he didn't desert? Say that in the letter? Then he could use the letter like he would the parole paper. Well, he could. But, Burley, uh, don't mention your age in that letter. Uh, you know, they can count up in Ohio. And it wouldn't do Mr. Emil Meyer's campaign no good to let the opposition know he was captured by... by a 12-year-old boy. It wouldn't help his chances at all. Just before the battle, the general hears a row. He says the Yanks are coming, I hear their rifles now. He turns around in wonder, and what do you think he sees? The Tennessee militia eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. We took these trials with quiet till we heard from some of the rash ones that the army was on a diet, that they had cut our rations. Reduce our rations further, twas difficult yet twas done. We had one meal a day, and now they give us none. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. I think my song has lasted almost long enough. The subject's interesting, but rhymes are mighty rough. I wish this war was over when free from rags and fleas. We'd kiss our wives and sweethearts and gobble goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. On top of old Smoky, all covered with snow, a wind is a blowing to the valleys below. It sighs in the chimneys, it cries at the door, telling me stories. I heard long ago. You've been listening to Tall Tales, a retelling of famous Tennessee legends. Tall Tales is heard every Tuesday evening at the same time. Tall Tales is written by Bill Woolsey. The ballad singer is George Grice. Tall Tales, produced by Marjorie Cooney, as a presentation of the Department of Special Program Services, and comes to you from WSN, the National Life and Accident Insurance Company in Nashville.